All right. So thank you all so much. My name is Darice Frencher, co-host of the Fort Worth HR Benefits and Compensation P uh, PEG. We are excited to have you here for May's webinar on mental health as far as, especially because it is Mental Health Awareness Month. And I am the owner of the Benefit Boutique. We provide employee benefit solutions to help small businesses attract and retain talent. I want to let my awesome co-host Susan Snipes do her introduction, and then we'll pass it back to me and I'll introduce our guest. Hi, I'm Susan. I'm here to help you however I can as it relates to human resources and payroll benefits. Just let me know. That's it. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. So guys, here. How did you guys say so much about us, uh, Susan and I getting great speakers? Let me tell you our secret. Go somewhere, and when I hear somebody that says something that is intriguing, insightful, or educating or, around benefits and compensation, I immediately go up to them and I ask them if they would join us on our webinar. And that is exactly how I met and invited Dr. Recently accomplished as a doctor, Lee Richardson, she is, she talked about mental health and the way I think about our, our, our peg is that the thing is a benefit. Mental health, wouldn't that be a benefit to help you attract and retain talent? So she is going to educate us today on what are the biggest mental health challenges being addressed in 2024 what you as a manager can do to help your organization. And this last outcome that I love is how we can individually create our own psychological safety. I'm in benefits, you HR professionals, I am hands down to y'all, right? <laughs> there has to be a lot of guarding your own psychological safety. So without further ado, Dr. Lee Richardson, Clinical Director of the Brain Performance Center, this floor is yours, but I don't think I made you a co-host. Hold on one second. <laughs> there you are, my friend. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, one, one quick housekeeping tip, guys. If you could turn off your cameras because we're recording this, so there won't be any latency for the those that are watching our replay. And then when we come back for questions, we want to see your beautiful faces then. So, Dr. Lee, I give it over to you, my love. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, you keep yours on, Dr. Lee. <laughs> okay, well, I wasn't, uh, thank you. Thank you so Well, thank you so much for having me. And I love talking about mental health and I love talking about brain health. And it's important that we stop and we look at how it's impacting the workplace this year. And, you know, we all, we, everybody has a job. And the hardest job I ever had was a stay-at-home mom. But we spend most of our waking hours doing that job. And, you know, historically, we see that after we go through a major event like COVID-19, it takes months, sometimes years, for the after effect to fully manifest. And that's what we're starting to see right now with mental health in the workplace. The, I've looked at a, st a study that Lyra did, and that's going to provide insight on an organizational level. And they compared 2022 and 2023. And they found that 94% 94, 94 of the companies surveyed reported that mental health benefits are three times as important to their employees as they were in 2022. And 84% recognized the need to create work culture that prioritizes mental health. Because if, if you wanna keep people engaged and productive, they've got to be brain healthy. There's no doubt about it. And it's not just, I mean, the COVID-19 left us all collectively. And when I say all, I mean globally. It put us in a lockdown and it left us with some aftermath that we're just starting to deal with. And going back to the survey, the benefit leaders say employee mental health has declined. And that means the numbers of people that are, that are getting mental health has increased. And 21% in 2022 declared they need mental health. And 2023, that number went to 34%. And the big challenge in 23 was work-related anxiety 
and something that concerns me a lot, and that's substance abuse disorders. When we look at the 2024 State of Workforce Mental Health Report, and you can Google that and you can pull up the 60 page report, but what I tried to do is just boil it down to offer you know, some key insight. One of the first things I saw in that report was 65% of US workers said their mental health challenges interfered with their ability to do their work. And we all know when our employees suffer, business suffers. The World Health Organization reports 12 billion, billion days that we lose each year from anxiety and depression. And that's costing us a trillion, one trillion dollars in lost, lost productivity. That's a lot of money. And I think that, you know, Bill mentioned he's a, he deals with financial stress. And I, NPR Today, reported that one out of five Americans is having a hard time paying their credit card debt. Two days ago, the Gallup News reported that inflation is a major financial concern. And then we've got all these international wars going on all around us. And all of this creates stress. And, you know, not all stress is bad. A little stress can, can be, uh, if you're stressed out about a job interview, that can get you on your game. But if you've got long-term chronic stress going on, it's going to create risk. Just look at the American Heart Association, and they talk about what high blood pre pressure does, increases heart attacks, increases strokes. On a, more, on, a, on a more daily basis, when we're stressed out, those of us that smoke, maybe we smoke more. Maybe we overeat. Maybe we don't go play our pickleball. We lack that physical activity. You know, maybe our nutrition slacks off. If we take medications, I've had people report they just quit taking the medication. So the that long-term stress does create, it does show up, and the body keeps score of everything that's going on in the brain. Headaches, body pain, stomach issues. And what I hear the most is it impacts sleep. And when you come in and you're fatigued, it's really hard to, to give it your best shot. There's been a huge increase in chronic illness. In 2019, 48% of employees reported it. In 2023, 58% did. There's been a big increase in mental health diagnosis. In 2019, 31% reported it. Last year, it was 45. So the numbers, the data is there, and the data is telling us what is going on. And that's when I looked at the report. I thought, well, what, you know, what are the key learnings for 2024? And we're almost halfway through 2024, but we're still not far enough past COVID to lose sight of how bad it has been for all of us. And the first finding that the survey produced was that people are facing a post-pandemic surge in serious and complex mental health conditions. There are more serious issues. Self-harm, those numbers have gone up. Suicide has gone up. Partner violence has gone up. Inpatient check-in is three times what it was in 2022. And what, what do we attribute this to? Work. Work is a big cause of the stress. And you know what, what workers are saying is lack of appreciation, lack of fair and equitable treatment. They don't feel like they're being treated properly. Over half of the U.S. workers are supporting a child with mental health challenges. And for those of you that are listening, if you're a parent, my boys are grown, they're adults. But to this day, if they're, if they're not okay, I'm not okay. And it's really, really hard when you, when you're, as a parent, you know, I'll, tell, I'll suck it up, buttercup, power through, man. But when it's your kid, you just can't do that. And it's getting, it's been really hard to get access to care. And it's even harder to find effective care. 73% of employees say that they want help from their employer to help them find a trusted resource. Because 
you know, there's finding someone can be difficult, but finding the right person can be even more difficult. And there's a big discrepancy between what employers and employees, their perspective on what the, the mental health needs are in the workforce. There's a big gap. What employees think is a high priority is different than what HR leaders may think is a priority. The good news is that 46% of employees believe that mental health has become a higher priority in the organization. And all of this falls down from the organization on the managers. And it doesn't matter if you're a, a, a higher ranking manager or one that's more in touch on, with the people on a day-to-day -day basis. And you know, it's interesting because there's a lot of people that have been placed in those manager roles that didn't ask for it. And it's the American way, work hard, get promoted. Of course, you're gonna take that promotion. Of course, you're gonna move into management. But there's an old belief that people don't quit jobs, they quit bosses. And the managers today have not been trained in an approach that prevents burnout or acknowledges the importance of well-being. So, you know, that's, that's a lot of information that came out of the survey. And after I read all that, I'm like, well, okay, I get those six points, but how are we going to use those? What, you know, what are the steps that we put in place? And the first one, how many of you in the audience know that your company has a mental health strategy? Maybe you know that there's a strategy. Do you know what it is? Because what I find working with companies and working with clients, that they have EAPs, but employees, oh, that's great. Susan created one for, for her clients. That's awesome. And But the working with employees, they know that there's an EAP, but they don't know how to access it. And there's, there's a little, they're a little bit afraid to access it. If I go tell that person at that EAP what's going on, are they going to tell my boss? Are they going to share information? And I think the first step is to build trust with employees that establishes those healthy work experiences. And the second thing is to, to look, you know, what are you, what spectrum of needs are you trying to meet? Remember, we talked about a minute ago that a lot of employees have children. They're working parents and they have children that have issues. Encourage your managers as HR leaders to put in place flexible hours and create some ERG groups. I mean, let working parents get together on their lunch hour and share peer advice. Nothing is more valuable than learning what another single parent did that was effective and learning how they did it. So really encouraging management and supporting people in the organization is important. And you've got, it goes back to trust and actions speak louder than words. You know, a lot of times we'll have these great ESG programs and plans on our websites. And when we talk to the S, the social, we'll talk about what we do for our employees' well-being. But if there's not actions behind that, it doesn't mean a whole lot. And you know, action can be passive or it can be active. On a passive level, listen to what employees are saying that they need. What do you need to protect your mental health? Do you need to set some boundaries in place on a more active level? Ask that question. You know, do, do you feel like that you you're psychologically safe? And if you don't, what do you need to create that safety? Because when it comes to mental health, we have to think we have to think systemic not about individual change, because if it works for one person, it's probably going to work for five or six. And the top three factors that have the biggest impact on well-being in the workplace, the first is realistic workloads. And a lot of times we create this unrealistic workload in our head. And a lot of times it's the organizational needs that do. But Unrealistic workloads create stress. 
being recognized for a good job creates well-being. And that doesn't have to be through a formal recognition program, just in a team meeting, acknowledging, you know, wow, Susan, you did a great job on that. And, and that gives people the feeling that they're going to be treated fair and equitably. And all of this, these three things, realistic workload, recognition, be fair and equitable treatment, all of that is within control of the employer. The Another point that the survey made is that, and you're right, Darius, recognition is powerful. But another point is that you've got to give managers the resources to lead mentally healthy, engaged teams. And I mentioned earlier, a lot of managers are new in the role. And managers need training, mental health conversations. And I've been trained since 2005, and I've had a lot of them. Doesn't mean they're all easy. They're very difficult to do unless you've had some training. And you need to focus on, you know, how do you promote mental well-being in the organization? The worldwide, we're looking at this. The World Health Organization and OSHA has issued directives to implement mental health initiatives that fight the psychological risk factors. And this is an amazing statistic to me. By the year 2030, six years from now, brain-related diseases are going to be the largest disability globally. Think about that. In six years, brain health, mental health, there, that's going to be the biggest problem that we have. And, you know, I try not to use that term, mental health. When in 2005, when I first got in the business, that's all I talked. And those were lonely conversations because there was so much stigma associated with mental health. And then in 2009, I changed my conversation. I'm going to talk about brain health because the brain is an organ, just like the heart is. And then in 2022, when I started the Brain Performance Institute, I thought I'm going to talk about brain capital because really that's what it's all about is building that mental, that brain health strong enough so that you do have some brain capital. And as managers, there are things that, you know, being aware of what's going on in an organization kind of helps you understand as a manager what your employees are facing. And what I tell all the managers in training is advocate. Be advocate for your people. It is okay to not be okay. That's the main reason I wrote my book. Turn your brain on to get your game on because it is okay. And people have got to know that. And when you talk to people about your about mental health, Think about the language that you use. Think about what you say. You know, use words that empower and support, not words that judge. Somebody comes in and you see them come in, you're like, wow, must have been a lot hard weekend you had. And what you're saying is, is, oh, I can see you're a little bit off your game and I care. What they hear is, oh, they think I partied all weekend. They're judging me. Think about every word that you say matters and speak kindly. I encourage everybody as a manager, check in with your people. And that doesn't have to be real complex. It can be as simple as, how are you? How are you doing today? And the response we all give, oh, I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm all right. Hmm. You know, when that person responds, look at look at their look at their face. Listen to their tone of voice. Watch their body talk. Because that's when you do, hmm, you know, you may come back and, and realize they're not fine. They're not okay. They're not all right. And instead of saying, oh, okay, well, um, well, um, have a good day stop and think about that. And maybe you say something like, mm, you know, I've been fine before. 
I'm here if you want to talk about it. Or depending upon your management style, maybe you say, mm, that wasn't very convincing. I'm here if you want to chat. Some other ways to respond to that would be, are you sure? If you want to talk, let me know. You know, it seems like something's bothering you. I'm here to listen if you want to share. Not everybody is ready to talk about it, but everybody will remember that you stopped and you asked them what was, you know, that you cared enough to ask them if they needed to talk. And Darius, thank you so much for, for leading into the next thing we're going to talk about. And that's the do's and the don'ts. And the, the first do is listen. Listen is listening it lets people feel like they're, they're seen, they're heard. And when you listen, they don't want you to fix their problems. The biggest problem I have with my husband is I come in and I just need to vent. All I need is for him to listen. And so a lot of times people, all that's what they need professionally too. You don't have to, to fix their problems. You have to, to listen and let them vent and let them know that, you know, anything you say to me, I'm going to treat confidentially. I, the only time I would share something would be if I thought that it could help make your situation better. And I would ask your permission before I shared that. Let them know and let them feel comfortable with sharing information. Another suggestion I have is to normalize it. And because everybody feels like, they're out there all by themselves. You know, I'm the only one that's feeling this way. I'm the only one having this problem. And just being able to say, you know, I listened to a podcast the other day and they talked about that in the podcast. Or just try to normalize those feelings however you can. And I think one of the most important things you can do is follow up. If you hear on a Monday I'm, I'm barely making it. Don't wait till Friday to come back and see how I'm doing. Maybe you can't get to it by Tuesday, but by Wednesday, pop your head in. Just, just check in. And I encourage every manager to have a coping box, a toolbox, that hopefully they'll be able to share with their, with their workers. And we'll talk more about that. So let's talk about the don'ts. Because the don'ts are, this is where I get really emphatic. And the, one of the worst things that you can do is use the term crazy. Oh, you're just, you know, you're crazy. And sometimes we'll say that we don't mean anything by it. But if you're on the brink and you feel like you are a little crazy, it's very judgmental. And it makes you, it makes you feel like you're having judgment passed on you. And the other thing I encourage is when somebody tells you they're struggling, don't give them the shoulds. Ah, there is. You should do this. You should really do this. Because the shoulds have these two friends. And these two friends are shame and blame. You know, well, I, I didn't do what they told me to do. Well, no wonder I didn't meet their goal. Well, it's all my fault. So stay away from the shoulds. The shoulds are deadly. And don't compare. I mean, when we're down, the, and that's what social media does. Social media has, has changed us into a comparative society. And when you compare, you got a winner and you got a loser. Even if that winning and losing is all up here, we'll force it. So don't compare. Don't compare to other coworkers and don't compare. Well, you know, two weeks ago, Lee, you were rocking it. What's wrong with you now? That's judgmental. So really think about every word that you say because it matters and speak kindly. I can't encourage that enough is to stop and think about the word choice that you use. You know, as a manager, if you remember one thing that I tell you, I hope it's this. People don't remember what you say or you do. They remember how you make them feel. Think about that. 
I had one manager made me feel like a million bucks. I could not wait to go in and and be part of the team and, and collaborate. And if I needed to stay extra and get something done, I was happy to do it. He made me feel like a million bucks. And I, when I think back about what he did, he was always looking for the good. And I'm a big believer. You always find what you're looking for. Look for the good. Absolutely. And when, instead of the negative. And, you know, we all have negative thoughts. The shoulds, those are the worst. But for those of us that seek for perfection on some level, we probably also have the all or nothing thinking, you know, and those are ants. Those are automatic negative thoughts. They go through your head so fast, so furious, you don't even know they were there. And what you as a manager can do is try to help your people to look, to, to ask, is there a healthier way to look about that or talk about that? And instead of saying, okay, what are y'all pissed off about? You know, reframe that. What's the situation that's making you feel bad? And let them talk through it because that will build a relationship with them. And remember, people remember how you make them feel. I always encourage everybody at the end of the day, practice some, some gratefulness. What are you, gratitude, what are you grateful for? And on a daily basis, check in with yourself. You know, I ask myself every day, Lee, what do you need today? Do you know I need to go to the gym? Or I just need to go out in the parking lot for, for five minutes and feel the sun on my shoulders. So check in with yourself. And one of the things on an individual level will we'll shift gears. You know, you've got to have tools when things get tough and they will get tough in the workplace. You've got to be prepared. And I encourage people to have a coping toolbox. And whether that's a shoe box, whether that's an empty tissue box, whatever it is, have some things in your desk that will help you cope. I have a little bottle of peppermint because when I feel brain fog going on, I'll just put some peppermint on and mm, that gives me clarity. I keep a candle in my drawer, a small one. When I feel overwhelmed, I'll light that candle. Now, not all of us have the you know, the, the capabilities are the space to do that. And, oh, I love this emergency chocolate. Oh yeah, that works. If you can't keep a coping toolbox, keep it, build a safety net. The basis of your safety net is to breathe. Anytime you feel that anxiety, you feel fearful. If you're riding that roller coaster, fight, flight, freeze, stop and breathe. All of us, our optimal breath rate is between four and seven breaths a minute. And to do that, you got to slow that breath down. You got to push that breath down into your diaphragm. And a lot of times, just when I catch myself at that high speed wobble and I'll stop and I'll pause. My personal affirmations are come into play a lot and I use them. Five years ago, when the tornado through, came through Dallas and destroyed my office completely, I'll never forget standing there in those suede boots as the water started to rise and sink in, and I started crying. And then that's not going to do me any good. I'll come back bigger and better and stronger. And I did. And I mean, I can remember standing in the backyard screaming that. And the universe manifested that for me. Abby Holiday came to me and said, we have an office you can use. Affirmations are powerful things. And, you know, some of the basics, focus on your basic needs. How many of you stay well hydrated? Did you know the brain weighs three pounds and the brain is 80% water and the brain doesn't have the capability to hold water? And, you know, so keep yourself hydrated. We should all be drinking 50% of our body weight in fluid ounces. And think about some mood boosters. I don't know about you, but I hear Bruno Mars and I'm ready to dance. So when people get, and Bill made the point earlier, when employees are stressed, 
They do. Their working memory is depleted. And a lot of people say it's brain fog. You know, I just, I, I lose my clarity. I, I'm, I just lose it. One of the most important points that I want to make, and, and I know we're getting close on time, is to process your feelings. If you don't, if you keep them spinning in your head, they're going to go round and round and round. So either, and you don't have to have a coaching, counseling, great way to process. You can journal. Someone mentioned journaling, I think, in the beginning. That's a great way. And, you know, think about this. Nothing makes me feel better than when I can do something to help somebody else. Practice an act of kindness. Do something nice for somebody. Help a stranger. You know, share. Share your goodness with other people. So I just wanted to close. I want to kind of recap what we talked about. The final brain health takeaways and their focus and, and build. This I hope you'll identify with, and that's building a return on investment of your brain capital. On an organizational level, there's been a huge shift in responsibility. Two years ago or three years ago, if you had, as an employee, had a mental health problem, that was your responsibility. The data, the surveys for the last two years show that shifted. It's the responsibility of an organization to create a supportive workforce culture where mental health is a top priority. And as a manager, we practice open, transparent communications and clarify expectations. Because a lot of times people build up in their head these, these expectations that are unrealistic. And even as a team member, active listening, somebody put that in the chat box, listening. You know, as a team member, you can listen. But as a team member, be inclusive. If you're going to listen to one person, listen to more than that on the team. And as an individual, take care of yourself. What's the first thing that you hear when you get on a plane before takeoff? And that is, in the event of an emergency, an oxygen mask is going to come down from the ceiling. Please take the mask and place it on your face first before you do somebody else's. Because if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anybody else. So I'm going to leave you with this one thought as leaders, and everyone is a leader. To create better business, you do that through better mental health and better brain health and by building that brain capital. That's that collective resource. That's your cognitive, your emotional, and your social skills. That's the nexus. That's what creates human connection and engagement. Thank you so much for, for your time today. And if anyone has a question, please, I am happy to provide a 15-minute consultation. And while D Darius takes the floor, I'm going to put my office number in here and my email because I'm happy to respond to any questions either way. And if anybody would like a copy of the presentation, I'm happy to share that. Because if you can take that and move it forward and just get somebody's awareness and create a higher level, you're working on your mental health and everybody else's. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Dr. Lee. I'm going to stop the recording, but I'm, I'm, I'm still, then we're going to open the floor up for questions. And um, Dr. Lee, what I'll do is I'll put your offer in the follow-up email for the complimentary 15-minute uh, consult. Because that's what, that's, okay, wait, let me stop the recording. <laughs> I wanted to ask, yeah, exactly how can, let me keep this on the recording, guys. How can you come in and help an organization? And then I'll stop the recording. Well, I think, you know, organizations oftentimes do not have an awareness of where their mental health is. And, you know, I'll come in and I'll do a SWOT analysis. I'll look at the strengths. And the strengths always are in your diverse, the diversity in your population. And I'll look at the weaknesses. And a lot of times that's communication. And there's always opportunities. You know, to managers, new managers need training. Having, being able to have mental health conversations takes a level of training. And then, you know, we all have threats. 
and uh, identify what the, what are the barriers. And a lot of times, if you can just establish a few boundaries, those barriers, then they're, they're not threats anymore. They're guidelines. So a simple SWOT analysis is something that's usually the first step that I do. And depending on the size of the organization, the complexity, if you have a mental health strategy or not, that's where it all starts. Got it. All right. Thank you so much.